that's the cover album of a mid-1960s uh, piece by The Drifters. How many of you are from an era old enough to know who The Drifters are? Okay, and know that amazing song, Under the Boardwalk. Well, here's what I feel like tonight. In 1967, I was a bass player in a rock band, and we got to open for The Drifters. <laughs> And here I am opening for what is going to be an amazing day tomorrow. My heroes are here. My scientific heroes are here. And I'm opening for them. Terry, it's such a privilege to, be, to have this opportunity. So thank you for that. I won't sing. <laughs> My band didn't let me get close to the microphone. So. Um, This is the theme. I think we want to make vampire food safe for vampires again. Can you all hear me? Yeah. Okay. Why, would, why would we want to do that? Well, vampires are at the top of the food chain, right? What do they drink? Yeah. Human blood. So they're drinking material that is heavily contaminated by chemicals that were never part of human body chemistry while vampires were evolving. So they don't have metabolic defenses <laughs> against those chemicals. If we can make vampire food safe for vampires again, we can make people healthier. We live in a new health era. Human health used to be mostly focused on communicable diseases, on infectious diseases, on epidemics like smallpox. That world has transitioned to one in which most medical practice now is focused on non-communicable diseases, many of which are related to malfunctions of the endocrine system of hormones. And here are some of them. Infertility, heart disease, endometriosis, obesity, diabetes. It, look at that list. And I'll, I could make this go on for long, but I'll just ask you once to raise your hand. If within your family and your close circle of friends, someone is there who is affected by one or more of these health conditions, put your hand up. That's the world we live in today. The good news about that is that the work that Terry and I do and Bruce Blumberg and Tyrone Hayes and Shauna Swan and others, this, this band of buddies who work on endocrine disruption, we are discovering the contributions of endocrine disrupting chem, uh, chemicals to this set of disease burdens. And what that is doing is giving us an opportunity to intervene and reduce those burdens. To me, that's really exciting. Um, and so that's what I want to talk to you about tonight. So here's the fetus. How did it get to here from a fertilized egg? And how does it get from this stage to a fully functional, healthy adult? Well, hormones, as Terry said, guide expression of genes, guide the turning on and turning off of genes at key points in the development of that fetus. Turn on. EDCs, endocrine disrupting compounds, hack that signaling system. Sometimes they prevent the gene from being turned on. Sometimes they turn it on when it is inappropriate to have it going. When that happens, the developing fetus is headed towards trouble. So they're, they're in the, for the public, there are two ways to think about genes. One of them is the classic, what did I inherit from my parents? The other, which is emerging out of this work, is about gene expression, gene behavior. Genes are nature's nanotechnology, making proteins we need at crucial times in the development of the fetus. 
What changes gene expression? Well, uh, classic genetic factors do. Heredity matters. What you get from your parents is important. Genes send signals back and forth among themselves. But we also have classic environmental factors. Diet, stress, experience, environmental contaminants, all can alter gene expression. What affects, out of the chemical world, what are some of the factors that affect gene expression? The bisphenols, perfluorinated compounds, phthalates, lots of different types of flame retardants, dioxins, PCBs, the list goes on and on. But I want you to think about this. Uh, now, the, if you think about the way that I learned about genes versus environment, it was one or the other. It was genetic or it was environmental. But what this new view does, it turns that on its head. Heredity is vital, but all those other factors affecting gene expression interact through genetics to determine what health becomes. And that's so important. When you hear a report from the Human Genome Project, what do you think? This disease is linked to that gene. Many people who aren't following the science think that that gene is responsible for that disease. But what this new science opens up is that, that when a disease is linked to a gene, it's one that is potentially vulnerable to environmental causes. And that's a complete switch. It means we have the opportunity to prevent health conditions that heretofore were perceived as fate. This is not me by myself or even the, the experts in the room saying this. There are many professional analyses that have come out over the last 20 years that have built this case. In 2013, the WHO, World Health Organization, published this report along with the United Nations Environment Program in which they concluded that endocrine disruption is a global public health threat. And it's because they reviewed the list of non-communicable endocrine-related diseases that are the current burden that we face, and they realized that there are plausible links to all of those. They realized that the changes that have, been, that have taken place in the frequency of, the, of those diseases over the last 100 years have taken place too rapidly to be just a result of changing gene frequency. They realized the data show at the time they confirm at least 800 chemicals in commercial use are endocrine disrupting chemicals. They reviewed evidence from wildlife, from laboratory studies with, with mice, with rats, in, in vitro work with cells, and epidemiological studies with people, all of which were coming together to say that that disease burden has among its contributors the types of exposures I'm talking about today. They also said that it's highly likely in 2013, given what we know for certain or with reasonable certainty, but also all the question marks that still remain, we're highly likely to be underestimating the magnitude of the effect, the, the, the range of diseases that are actually implicated. Um, and then most crucially, they said, this new body of knowledge is giving us opportunities to prevent diseases we didn't have a clue before were preventable. That's the take home message. So science comes from people. It's a human enterprise. We've got several people here in the room who have contributed valiantly to the emergence of this field. And I'll introduce them to you uh, as I go through this. Um, But I mostly want to make sure you come to hear their talks tomorrow, because Terry has assembled an amazing group of speakers. One of the things the WHO report set up was the calculation that the disease burden induced by endocrine disrupting compounds is not only harmful to health, it's harmful to the economy. And this guy, who I hope is going to show up tomorrow, is, have we heard from Leo that his plane worked? Not yet. 
okay? He's coming in from New York and they had a bit of a dis weather disturbance. Um, Leo led a multi-year effort, uh, which I'll let him tell you the details about, but it developed a series of calculations leading to the conclusion that in Europe, endocrine disrupting exposures was costing the European economy at least 167 billion euros a year, using some Markovian modeling. Um, and the US was almost twice that, and I'll let him explain that to you. So this is something that's burdensome for human health, for families, it's also burdensome for the economy. I'm gonna lead you through a, a revol what, what really amounts to a revolution in science that's unfolded over the last 30 years as we, since we began talking about this. And I'm not gonna get into the weeds, and I'm gonna to turn to some of the experts who'll be talking tomorrow to help you understand the details, but let me just summarize from 30,000 feet what this revolution looks like. Low doses matter a lot. Doses that toxicologists 20 years ago couldn't even measure, barely could measure. They matter a lot. As, as Terry said, hormones work at infinitesimal doses in, with, in our bodies. The chemicals that behave like hormones do as well. Second, events in the womb don't stay in the womb. There can be lifetime consequences all the way out into aging that begin with endocrine disruption in the womb. And uh, it goes beyond that, which I'll get to. Thirdly, what, the way we've gone about figuring out what's safe and what's not, the way the FDA has done it, the way the EPA has done it, those methods have horrendously flawed assumptions. And I'll give you some details about that. So really, if you look at their recommendations today for what's safe, for our families, the people who work on endocrine disruption will tell you they've got it all wrong. Fourthly, unfortunately, exposure is ubiquitous. Um, and I'll give you some examples of that. So this is a photograph of frogs. I'm gonna make the first point, low doses really matter. This is an African clawed frog, and um, it's a picture by Tyrone Hayes, who's over here, who we'll be talking tomorrow. Um, why is it? So the thing about these two frogs is those are brothers, and they are mating. The male on the bottom is a fully functional female, can lay eggs, they can be fertilized, they can grow up. Tyrone worked out how exposure to 2.5 parts per billion as that tadpole is maturing and transforming into an adult frog, 10% in this sample of frogs, 10% of them become fully functional females. 2.5 parts per billion of atrazine, a widely used herbicide. Here's Tyrone admiring one of his subjects. Here's the uh, male that is actually a functional female and a real male and mating and their eggs. What, it, what I wanna focus on here is how low that dose is, 2.5 parts per billion. Here's a log scale of the concentration of atrazine. When a farmer applies that to a cornfield, that herbicide, he, wants, he or she wants the dose to be about a million parts per billion. If you start measuring downstream from the application, you find it at about 80 part, 80, excuse me, 8,000 parts per billion in runoff off the field. You find it at, uh, at lower concentrations, but still uh, above 100 parts per billion in streams. EPA has determined short-term exposure to atrazine is safe at 100 parts per billion. Surface waters miles downstream from application can be found at 80 parts per billion. EPA says about two point, about two point, no, two parts per billion, three parts per billion is safe for drinking water. That's just about the exposure that that in the tadpole was sufficient to completely change the course of development and make a male become a female. 
And because atrazine is volatile, it evaporates off the fields, rises into the clouds. It's absorbed to droplets that are carried downwind. You can find atrazine in rainwater hundreds of kilometers downwind from the, from the fields at about one part per billion. So low doses can matter a lot. Events in the womb don't stay in the womb. I'm going to introduce to you a person who unfortunately couldn't come here this evening, Fred Vomsal, who is the world's expert on bisphenol A, BPA. Um, Fred, since the 1990, early 1990s, has done phenomenal work, which began with very basic work in hormonal physiology and reproductive physiology. But when he began to see the consequences of exposure to endocrine disrupting compounds like bisphenol A, he pivoted because he realized how important his work was for human health. Um, I'm going to show you one result from Fred. Um, we all had a nice dinner, so we don't have to worry about dinner anymore. This is the inside of one of Fred's frogs, or excuse me, Fred's mice. Um, it's a mouse that's about my age in mouse years. Normal kidneys, normal bladder. It's a male. What would have happened had that f mouse in the womb been exposed to 20 parts per billion of bisphenol A? This is an experimental mouse exposed to 20 parts per billion, about my age in mouse years. Its kidneys have gone completely necrotic. Its bladder, if it had been allowed to live, would have exploded in the next few days. What happened? Well, the urethra, which is the tube through which the animal and we pee, in a male passes through the prostate gland en route to the outside world. And there's a key set of tissues uh, where it's going through the prostate gland that responds to bisphenol A that forever changes how that tissue responds to further natural hormonal stimulation. And also, and this is a, there's some manipulations going on here where Fred varies the testosterone and estrogen levels so that it manipulates what happens as men age where estrogen goes up, testosterone goes down. And that tissue, that change in how, in the epigenetic control of that tissue's growth, that tissue gradually constricts until the animal can no longer pee. Now, if you're a traditional toxicologist using traditional toxicological tools, you would never ever suspect so that something that it happened in the womb would have led to this type of consequence. Fred's really excited with some of his urological colleagues right now because they are working on interventions to see how that process can be reversed, or halted or reversed. It's the first medical uh, model of uh, some conditions that have become relatively common in people, in older men. Um, although they don't yet have data that implicate BPA in the human condition. Um, the story of not having, not, uh, if what happens in the womb doesn't, end of the womb became much more complicated beginning about 12 years ago when scientists began to publish on what's called transgenerational epigenetic inheritance. What is that? That's when exposure to, to a great-grandmother can be transmitted down generations without changes in DNA sequence. And that was led by a guy from Washington State University, Mike Skinner, by Bruce Blumberg, who will be speaking about this and related things tomorrow, uh, by a range of different scientists, different scientists at labs, uh, Lots, several different laboratories, all of them pointing towards the importance, the reality of this phenomenon, and even if their details about exactly how it works aren't clear, it's a real phenomenon. And the model that they all used was exposure to great-grandmother, 
stop any additional exposures except that are those that are caused because great grandmother is exposing her daughter whose eggs are in the in the fetus and so there's some transgenerational carryover of the exposure but down by the time you got the, the great granddaughter there's no direct exposure okay so that's been the, the model then this past summer Patricia Hunt at Washington State University said you know that's not what happens in the real world in the real world great grandma's exposed and then mom is exposed or grandma is exposed and mom is exposed and they're all exposed. So what happens? We've only looked at that single exposure. What happens if we mimic the real world? And so Pat set up an experiment in which she exposed males right after birth uh, to a model estrogen and then tracked down the consequences of that uh, on fertility in the male mice that were part of this track. These are all male mice. And um, the, the reds in that are being exposed and the blues aren't. So she's trying to, she's able to separate out the true transgenerational inheritance exposure pattern without where well, they weren't exposed subsequently versus the ones that are exposed continuously. And although this is a little complicated, um, what she found was that there is a compounding of the effect over generations. By the third generation, there were males that were manifesting disease endpoints did not in the reproductive system that did not occur in earlier generations, and some of them were completely infertile. So you're going to hear tomorrow about a related study by Shauna Swan, who's sitting here, who is one of the great heroes of efforts to understand whether, in fact, there are long-term changes in human sperm count, and if there are, what might be causing them. Um, she published this summer a really important paper, a, a huge analysis with collaborators from Israel and other countries, looking at how male sperm count and quality have changed over time. And she found, consistent with earlier studies, but with a much larger sample size, she found that from the early 1970s to 2010, there's been something like a 63, 60% uh, 60 decline in sperm count. The, the interesting thing about that is what would lead to a, continu a continuing decline over generations, because there are several generations reflected here. And while we clearly don't have an answer yet, the work by Pat Hunt looking at what happens with the additive, the compounding effects over generations, may in fact be a clue that helps understand why not only did this decline continue, but is, there's no sign of it showing, it's slowing down today. And I'm, I know Shauna will say some stuff about that tomorrow. So the testing methods are deeply flawed. It's astounding. <laughs> My jaw has hit my desk too many times. I think there's a bruise here. As I, as I understand the deepest elements of FDA's procedures, I've got a new one from this week that I'll tell you about. Um, their assumptions and their tools are outdated, decades old, assumptions centuries old, and we can show those assumptions are false. As a result, well, let me show you this picture. Um, I'm going to make two points here. One is that chemicals can cause obesity. I'm not going to say very much about that because Bruce is going to talk about that a lot tomorrow. Um, but then I'm going to relate this to how this reveals the false nature of the key assumption used in regulatory toxicology. So this is work by Retha Newbold at the um, National Institute of Environmental Health Sciences. Uh, it's the same strain of mice, same caloric intake monitored over the lifetime of these adult mice, same activities levels also monitored. And you can see that one is morbidly obese. What happened? It was exposed to one part per billion body weight of an estrogenic chemical at birth. 
Now, there are now data from multiple, multiple endocrine disrupting chemicals that show similar patterns. As I said, uh, Bruce is going to, and that's what he looks like, he's now outed. Um, Bruce is going to talk about the bio biology behind the, uh, an effect that he, in 2005, I believe it was 2005, coined uh, the obesogenic effect. And Bruce has a book that's coming out in 10 days called The Obesogen Effect. I strongly recommend it to you. Um, it really, it's a brilliantly written summary of the biology underlying these types of patterns, but also um, what you can do about it. What I want to do is ask, what does this tell us about the flawed assumptions of regulatory toxicology? And I, I'll do that with a question. So one part per billion produces morbid obesity. What would 1,000 parts per billion do? How many of you watch Monty Python? <laughs> Remember that scene where the guy eats the last wafer? Explodes? OK. Do you think the mouse would explode? Actually, it's scrawnier than the control mouse. It loses weight compared to the control mouse. All of regulatory toxicology assumes that if you test at high doses, you can anticipate what low doses are going to cause. But in this case, and in many cases, low, high dose experiments don't, tell you, don't give you a clue about what's happening at low doses. I want to show you some data from Wade Welshons um, at University of Missouri, where he worked this out with tamoxifen. How many of you know what tamoxifen is? It's a drug used to treat breast cancer. And why it is used is shown in this graph. Um, high doses of tamoxifen suppress the growth of breast cancer tumors. Now, this is actually not an, uh, an academic question. Lots of people take tamoxifen. Lots of people don't who are taking it don't metabolize all of it. So it gets into the water system. They pee. It goes out into the water. The sewage treatment systems are not equipped to deal with that. And so there's tamoxifen and lots of others. Terry can go on at length about, and lots of other pharmaceuticals in water that's going into rivers that are then in the intake of human water systems downstream. So not an academic question. What's a safe level of tamoxifen? The way regulatory toxicology works is you begin at a high dose on the, the far right of that graph, where there's a big statistically, statistical significantly, yes, big statistically significant difference between the, con, the experimental and that line, which is the control. And the statistical significance is indicated by the as, red asterisk. So you, you're a regulator. You work down the dose response curve. The first is significant. The second is significant. The third one's not. And so you call that the no observed adverse effect level. And then you acknowledge the weaknesses of your experimental tools and the, the uncertainty of the models. And you add some safety factors that one of them is a factor of, of 10 because animals aren't little people, or people aren't, yes, animals aren't little people. Uh, you have another t factor of 10 because kids aren't little adults. And you have another factor of 10 because um, there's lots of human variation. And you come up with a process where you divide the Noel by 1,000, and that gives you the safe level. But regulatory toxicology long ago decided it was not worth it to test this level for safety. You assume that it is, because how could something a 1,000-fold beneath the level which you saw an effect possibly have an effect? Well, hormones behave differently. Here's the true dose response curve where Wade Welshans tracked it all the way down. And you can see right at the safe level is something called the tamoxifen flare, where, and this is well known in the medical community, they have to structure their dosing regime so that women don't spend very much time with a t blood level the same as the flare level, because right there, the tumor is growing and it hurts. So at Coincidentally, at the level FDA's process would lead it to conclude that tamoxifen is safe, it's actually at its most dangerous level, causing, promoting growth of, of breast cancer tumors. So if Wade then 
identifies a quote unquote true Noel and uses the same process, a factor of 1,000, 10 times 10 times 10, uh, to calculate the safe level. There's, this, in essence, no safe level of tamoxifen in drinking water. Um, this whole issue, non-monotonicity, uh, is a mathematical term, meaning that the slope of the curve changes direction somewhere on the curve. This whole issue has a, a, a leader, uh, Laura Vandenberg, uh, who's at Amherst, um, a brilliant speaker, unfortunately could not be here tonight. She and a, and a group of us wrote a big review of non-monotonicity in 2012. It took us three years, countless conference calls. Um, and we published it. And within six months, there was a big meeting in Germany of public health professionals, industry scientists, government scientists, all coming together to talk about how could this possibly be real? And fortunately, the Endocrine Society, which is the professional society of medical folks who specialize in endocrinology, specialize in now in endocrine disruption, um, they were present also. And, and they said, wait a second, this is, this is how hormones behave. Why should we expect chemicals that behave like hormones not to have this aspect of their behavior? Um, at the meeting, the US EPA committed to studying this phenomenon and producing a report that they would then submit to the National Research Council, part of the National Academy of Sciences, um, and asked the National Academy to review their review of the issue. The EPA did that. They gave the report to the National Research Council. After about six months, no, nine months, the National Research Council issued their report and saying to the EPA, you got to start over again. What you did is not scientific. Because in essence, the EPA said, we don't see this type of stuff in any way that's clinically relevant. In fact, I had meetings as this, we were moving towards this, the meeting in Germany with FDA, sitting across the table from a FDA, an FDA scientist. She looked at me and she said, we don't see that. And I said, you don't test at the levels that are relevant. She said, oh, yeah, you're right. 10 minutes later, she was saying again, oh, we don't see that. Um, and that's been their attitude then, before, and to this day, that if a, if a dose response curve has these funny shapes to it, it couldn't possibly be real because the dose makes the poison. Um, at one level, the dose, dose does make the poison. At that, that tamoxifen flare is at a very specific dose, and it doesn't happen at other doses. But the dose makes a poison has been used to justify high dose testing to, and avoid low dose results. Um, I, I love this metaphor. Works for me. Um, how many of you have seen photographs from the Hubble Space Telescope that look like that? Just amazing science. Well. If the FDA were challenged to do something similar on non-monotonic dose responses or to look, at, look for the galaxies that the Hubble Space Telescope reveals, they basically go into their backyard with, micro, with binoculars and say, I don't see anything. Uh, no joke. Um, the FDA uh, last, uh, two weeks ago released a new report on BPA, bisphenol A. And uh, I, we've written some things about uh, some of the weaknesses of that report. But in a conference call on this Monday, I learned another twist on how they're approaching their science and how it really doesn't fit with the way any scientist in this room, I think, would work. Here was the issue. Um, they were saying that. Um, if you've got a control group and you have an experimental group and the control group has some overlap with the experimental group, it's all within natural variation. How many of you have heard of t-tests? This was not using a t-test to say it's not worth, it, it, it's kind of like saying, um, 
breast cancer occurs normally. So what if there's a 50% increase in breast cancer? It's within natural variation because it occurs normally. That's how FDA has told the group of people who are involved in this experiment, the real scientists who are there, they're going to respond to their final results. It's the, um, the, not, the dose makes a poison stuff dates back to uh, the 1500s with a scientist, toxicologist from Switzerland named Paracelsus. This stuff predates Pearson, the man who developed the T-test. So their work, and that was, Bruce, when did T -t when was the T-test developed? Before, the 19 before 1900, yeah. Anyway, out of date. As a result of their techniques being out of date, their laws and their regulations are out of date. And they stay that way because the financial stakes are so high and they're really good, at, and industry defending those products are really good at manufacturing uncertainty. Um, that FDA scientist who told me we don't measure at those levels in 2012 today works for a law firm um, earning 10 times what she did for the FDA, manufacturing doubt about the, what science is telling us now about chemicals. Unfortunately, this is one example. Um, the last estimate I saw, BPA was worth about $750,000 an hour in revenue. That pays for a lot of lawyers. Um, so exposure is ubiquitous. I'm looking puzzled because there's a missing slide. Maybe it'll come up. Oh, yes, it will come up. Um, endocrine disrupting compounds come from the distillation of petroleum and all the products that uh, are associated with that, including plastics. Um, they come from the use of pesticides near homes. Nick, how many of you read Nick Kristof in the New York Times? He, he's written a series of brilliant um, columns about this, including one that features Bruce and at least two that feature Shauna reflecting on endocrine disrupting compounds. And, and what he realized and what led him to do this is that he, he, he acknowledges that we've done a great job over the last 40 years with the EPA at putting massive amounts of chem industrial chemicals into the air and the water. The Cuyahoga is no longer burning. But instead, we found pathways of exposure where we are putting things through products we use directly into our bodies. What are some of those products? Well, it's the food we eat, the pesticides we use in our homes, the personal care products, the couches contaminated with brominated flame retardants, the computers uh, contaminated with flame retardants. Um, thermal paper. How many of you know the thermal paper story? Thermal paper is that receipt that comes out of, of an ATM machine or the gas station or your plane ticket, at least some plane tickets. Um, and there isn't ink in that printer. Instead, there are microcapsules of a clear dye that's embedded in the paper. And as it comes out, thin needles that are hot pierce the paper, break the bubbles that release the dye, and it comes up to the surface to combine with BPA on dust, dust that's on the surface. And because it's dust, it's not glued on or anything like that, virtually every Currents, bill of currency, dollar bill, yen, yuan, that's been sampled heretofore um, has BPA dust on it because we put our receipts in our wallets. I was talking about this at uh, college uh, a few years ago, and a young man puts his hand up and says, uh, Dr. Myers, um, I sometimes burn those papers. Is that a problem? And I, I had this vision of this swirl of smoke coming up from the stack of paper. Why was he burning the paper? But I just said, look, just don't breathe it. Another guy puts his hand up and says, uh, Dr. Myers, he, he rolls his joints with those. <laughs> Why? Because the little microcapsules of dye sparkle when they're burned. I called Fred Vamsal the next day. Uh, and said, Fred, you got to hear this. Because I'd done some research and I could find debates online about, among 
people, you, you Google joints and, and thermal and receipt papers. You, there's a discussion under where there was back then. And the conclusion of the discussion was it's not a problem if it doesn't have ink on it. I've already told you how false that is. Um, th we have filled our homes with products and packaging and other things that um, are bringing contaminants directly to us, um, defeating all the great work that was done to clean up the air and clean up the water directly. We assume that products are safe. Anything on the market ought to be safe. Well, you already heard how weak this testing processes are. Well, then think that almost none of the products have been tested in the beginning. There's a class of chemicals called generally regarded as safe under FDA terms that were grandfathered in 1976 into the law controlling chemicals. Um, basically saying, oh, we haven't seen anyone die from using that, so you can go ahead and use it. I want to give you an example. Uh, and what that means is the vast majority of chemicals have not been tested. And I want to give you an example of one of the more outrageous cases of generally regarded as safe. And it came about because of the oil spill in the Gulf. Um, they used a surfactant called Corexit to try and control the spill, to disperse the spill. And they did some really primitive testing on how, uh, whether it was estrogenic or androgenic, um, and then left it at that. They got no results. But then a colleague of ours uh, and his graduate student, a colleague being Lou Gillette and his graduate student, um, being Lexi Temkin, who we'll be talking tomorrow, um, decided to look at the potential obesogenicity of this compound called doctyl sodium sulfosuccinate, which has taken me a long time to learn how to say. Um, and they learned that uh, it does have characteristics of obesogenicity, although they may be somewhat different from uh, the work that Bruce has done, according to some new stuff. I don't know if Lexi's going to talk about this tomorrow. Um, but the shocking thing for me was when they took this, I wasn't surprised to discover that there was an unexpected mechanism of toxicity, endocrine related. What shocked me was when she presented this in grand rounds to uh, the medical school of South Carolina and mentioned DOSS. Some hands went up in the audience and said, wait a second, that's a surfactant used as a laxative by pregnant women. It had been generally regarded as safe. And so it, I, you go to the local CVS or Walmart or, or a drug, any drugstore and you go to the laxative section and this is the, prominent, the, the dominant laxative used and yet it appears to have obesogenic effects. Here's just a sample that I found. So what's the good news here? <laughs> um, as a scientist, I really value the fact that science is getting a lot stronger. We're, we are now acknowledged by the National Institute of Health, by similar agencies in Europe like WHO, is, is really focusing on a big problem. Um, the medical community is getting on board. The Endocrine Society, which I mentioned before, which is the world's largest association of professional endocrinologists, 18,000 people distributed around, the, I think, 122 countries. They are so totally on board on this, they are sending people to testify in, in, within European debates about how Europe should manage um, endocrine disruption. And they've also been at the meetings with us, and I'm actually a member of the society, um, it, meeting with the FDA and others. Uh, other professional medical societies uh, have also uh, gotten on board. Consumers, thank you very much, are demanding safer materials. That's creating a reward system for companies that change the composition of their products in the right direction. Fortunately, we have enough science now to help chemists make those safer materials. 
not guaranteed safe, but definitely in the right direction. That's really good news. Not only is there a demand for the products, we have the ability to supply it. And then there are places in the world where there are rational responses to this science. Several states have made a lot of progress, and, and Europe, as I mentioned, is, is doing a lot as well. You see things like this. Um, BPA-free compounds, or material, or products. The unfortunate result, though, is that now we've learned that the replacements for BPAs in, BPA in many of these products is are minor variants on BPA. They're BPS, BPF, BP, whatever. And all the toxicology we have in hand tells us these are very regrettable substitutions. And it's, we didn't expect to have this consequence, and we're trying to get ahead of it um, and think that we can. So um, I said that the science is getting better, getting in a position where the biologists, like Bruce and Shauna and Tyrone can help the chemists like Terry and his colleagues, colleagues design safer materials. And one of the projects we all have been involved in for some time now um, is just that, bringing together teams of green chemists and teams of endocrine disruption specialists to work together to develop an intellectual framework that allows that design process to move forward. Um, This is Terry. We gave them, we gave the green chemists green aprons and the biologists blue aprons and we lined them up in front of a curtain. They didn't have a clue about what was going to happen. We pulled the curtain back and there was a gourmet chef who spent two hours teaching them in teams how to work together. With the one rule being you couldn't have a knife and a glass of wine in your hands at the same time. <laughs> it turns out the chemists were really proud of how well they could cook things, and the biologists were really proud about how well they sliced and diced. <laughs> this is a major opportunity to move forward. We, I, I personally think that, certainly in this country for the next three years, we're not going to make any regulatory progress. Um, we are going to make some progress in Europe. They're much more attuned to the science. Where are we going to make progress is by rewarding chemists with money to make safer products. And that's a role that the public is playing increasingly uh, because of the awareness that uh, has been spread uh, far and wide. And so I think that if we have a chance of reversing the trends in these disease burdens, it's going to be hard. It's going to take a lot of people to continue work on it. There are going to be starts and two steps forward and one step back. But my long-term vision is that we will make progress and we will have a healthier generation of people. So thank you. Yeah. Pete will take questions then. How should one get rid of that thermal paper, and is there any, any attempt? Yeah, if, if people would come to the mic, that'd be great. I just wondered about that thermal paper. I've heard you shouldn't recycle it. And then I also wondered if there's any attempt to try to get industry to change those thermal printers. Um, first of all, you're right. It is being recycled, and uh, BPA is present in recycled cardboard used to package pizzas, probably because of recycling of thermal paper. Um, there is a lot of effort. Oh, there's Leo. I sh showed his photograph earlier today. I put you on the spot, Leo. Um, uh, there is a, a lot of work underway. In fact, when we first learned of this product, we, did, we sampled thermal paper in the Boston area and found that about 50% of it was BPA-based and 50% was not. And I, my reaction was, great, there's a functional product is economically competitive with BPA technology. If we highlight the risks of BPA, it'll quickly supplant it in the market. Well, it has BPS. We didn't know at the time it was BPS. Um, my 
uh, nonprofit allows people to take photographs of receipts or photographs of the gas station so you can see how much it costs. You can avoid handling them. We recommend that cashiers use latex gloves, maybe from Lexi's company. But they still have to dispose of it. So. They still have to dispose of it, yep. Um, I, ultimately, I, I hope that we increasingly move toward uh, an economy that uses electronic receipts. Um, it's quite feasible now. It's just not, I'm not sure every outlet uh, is capable of moving there today. But there is a lot of movement. There are different, there's some non-bisphenol based technologies that are uh, on the market today. The toxicology about them is not yet clearly worked out. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you for an excellent presentation. Uh, maybe one advantage of being a little bit older is that uh, when you were in Rome, you weren't exposed to these chemicals. Whereas if you're a millennial, uh, maybe you have something to worry about. Is is that is there a generational issue? That uh, actually, yes, there very easily could be, particularly if you consider the compounding effects that I described from Pat Hunt's work uh, combined with Shauna's work. But actually, there was a amazing um, epidemiological study, uh, series of studies conducted uh, in a health institute in Berkeley, California, uh, beginning to, that came out in beginning around 2000, that were based upon the prescient work of a physician who stored um, cord blood at birth um, and kept it in freezers for 50 years. This was in the Kaiser Health Program. And they have detected, for example, and Shauna can probably correct me on the details of this. Um, they, have, they have detected, for example, that if you were uh, beyond puberty, when the age of DDT came in place, where it became really hard not to be exposed to DDT, your rates of breast cancer at the age of 50 were much lower than, five times lower, right? Uh, than women who went through puberty after the age of BPA, we got into the age of DDT. So there are generational effects, and she probably has some additional examples, but it is a, it is a concern. Um, talk to a teacher who has been around for a while and ask them about classroom behaviors and how that has changed over the last 30 years. I didn't mention any of the neurobiological effects that are now are clearly plausible. In fact, today, just today, a study was published, a meta-analysis of um, uh, the contribution of endocrine disrupting compounds, specifically BPA, to ADHD, looking at a combination of animal experiments and human epidemiological studies. And they reached, they reached the conclusion that um, with, in the, with the sort of certainty you, you can reach with these types of studies, um, it's highly likely that BPA is contributing to ADHD. So you mentioned this uh, BPA and BPS. I have a similar situation with arsenic in the poultry industry, where we got them to stop using rocks or so, and then they went to use rice. Yeah. It's still an organic or and still had properties. I mean, how do we convince the industry that this isn't a good idea. And especially the uh, you know, big promotional things when Tyson comes up and says, oh, we're not using this anymore. How do we come back? And that, if, if you could answer that question, I would retire. <laughs> um, right now, we're looking for, uh, we being the community at large, um, they're trying to find ways to highlight what are called regrettable substitutes, where we have a bad compound, we, re we replace it with something off the shelf where there's a thousand times more known about the stuff you're trying to get rid of than the stuff you're replacing it with. Ultimately, the long-term solution to that problem is by implementing the intellectual approach that Terry and I and Bruce and others worked on, we, where we, the companies save money and they make a profit by selling things that they can show are inherently safer. It's going to be a long time before that penetrates all sectors of industry. But we do, for example, I presented this at a meeting in Zurich 
um, about five years ago, and uh, this system. And I was met with a hostile reaction by the chief toxicologist of Nestle, whose headquarters were right near where we were meeting. Um, this same meeting occurred this year. Uh, and the same guy presented their new approach, basically our approach, although he wouldn't acknowledge it. But the same type of logic behind it. If they, Nestle lost $100 million because they made a mistake in the print, that they, in the way they applied print to packaging. They had to remove $100 million worth of product from the Indian market. They understood that unless they do this better, they're going to be hit with unexpected costs all the time. that are so persistent that we're going to be dealing with them for the foreseeable future. And we have companies that are releasing more and more complex mixtures so that they're hard to put back exactly what's in there. Do you have any idea what sort of prioritization we could use to have to tackle these problems? <laughs> I have to think about that. Um, I, I think... Um, The way the public response to this is vital. The public response to this to date has created a market for companies to make money. The public response to date has been to only a tiny fraction of the potential recipients of this message. I, I, so, so I went to Reed College. I, went to, I got a PhD at Berkeley. I didn't think about markets at all. But I run into this problem, and I see the power of helping chemists make money. And I, th I think that, that we've got to build that momentum a lot. And there are people working on different pieces of it, um, doing campaigns to um, punish people selling bad stuff, doing campaigns to encourage people who are trying to do the right thing. There's so much more happening in this space than there was even five years ago that it's encouraging. But we need more. We need communications efforts that drive that message home. We need companies that are responsive to the economic benefits they gain. And we need more collaborations like what Bruce and Terry and I and others participated in to refine those approaches even better. Thanks for your clear thought. I really appreciate that as somebody who's uh, really outside this uh, field, I help architects make safe buildings. There's a lot of chrome on the faucets and things. I've been trying to understand hexavalent chromium and exposure. Um, is that an issue? Would, is that an endocrine uh, disruption? The mechanisms of hexavalent chromium, as far as I know, do not involve endocrine disruption. Terry, do you want to, or Leo, do you want to say anything about that? Leo? Yeah, they're mute. That that doesn't make them good. Yeah, and so that's sort of out of my area of competency. But, but Pete, you would be the first to say that um, endocrine disruption in early, in early life often set up tissues for later life cancer. Oh, totally. There's some really superb work uh, being done. I don't know. If, did you hear what he said? Part of it, yeah. Um, just like the, the bladders were set up to explode by early life exposures, well, early life exposures can also increase uh, sensitivity to carcinogenic substances later in life. Uh, some of the best work on that's been done with prostate cancer and subsequent exposure to uh, early exposure and then later in life exposure to other endocrine disrupting compounds. But it, 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 there's, I have no reason to expect that mutagenic substances wouldn't also uh, work through that later in life mechanism also. Yes, I'm sorry. Do you want to use the mic? I think she's going to bring it to you. Are there any studies, um, that you could point to that would, that trace the life of 
various EDCs, <coughs> whether for systems in the environment? Um, actually, there is one absolutely brilliant study of bisphenol A and where you find it in the environment and how much there is of it and it's m the many pathways it follows and is written by this gentleman here. A, a brilliant review of exactly that. Th there are, uh, there's actually a literature on, um, for example, the, the, the pathways that persistent organic pollutants take um, as they volatilize and then condense and volatilize again and work their way through atmospheric currents to various places. So there is, there's a, a lot that's been done along those lines. But his writing, which was published last year, uh, is a good place to start. Um, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to just pick up on that for a minute. Because uh, one of the things about me is I have great people to work with. And where's Matt Donato? Matt, stand up, Matt. So Matt is a postdoc in my group. He'll speak tomorrow. Really, Matt's the principal scholar uh, behind the, the BPA uh, expo exposure stuff. It's everywhere. <laughs> there, isn't a, there isn't anywhere on this planet not contaminated by BPA. Ladies and gentlemen, please thank Pete for an amazing opening. If I could make one last comment. I, I see Brian Biancoski over here. Terry mentioned our, yes, yeah, stand up, mentioned the publication we do, Above the Fold in Environmental Health News. That's the man that makes it happen every day.